Good afternoon. And on behalf of First Trinity Lutheran, we would like to welcome you very much to, the, to DC. Now, First Trinity may actually be the largest congregation in the country, if not the world. How is this possible? You're in the middle of DC, you see. Well, that's how. You see, we have a flat roof, and we have two thriving honeybee hives on that roof. And every spring, we have a blessing of the bees and welcome them to our congregation. Since each hive has about 30,000 bees, we figure that makes us the largest congregation. <laughs> so again, on behalf of all of our members, human and insect, welcome. Absolutely the largest. The history of First Trinity dates back to 1852. That was nine years before the Civil War. There's a picture of our old church uh, there on the same location with a horse and buggy in front of it. So times have changed. Times have changed for all of our churches. And, and what do we do when times change? Well, our congregation now is, is racially diverse. We are social economically diverse. And we worship, instead of thousands of people, about 70 to 90 people on a Sunday morning. Uh, but we're still growing. Not, not, not largely, but we're still growing. A couple weeks ago, we, we, we took in seven new young adults, all under the age of 35. I'm becoming one of the oldest members there. Uh, I've been a pastor there since 2003, but I've been involved in the social ministry of, of our church there on the corner of 4th and E since uh, 1983. This has been my first call out of seminary. And I went to, for those of you who are still around, I went to Seminex. Any Seminex out there? I arrived at First Trinity in January of 2006. I lived just a couple blocks away, and I thought it was the most brilliant idea ever to go to church where I only had to get out of bed about half an hour before Sunday morning services. <laughs> Way to go, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know, however, what I was actually getting myself into. You see, every time we conduct a survey of the members of First Trinity to find out why they attend First Trinity instead of one of the other congregations in the area, the answer always comes back. First Trinity's commitment to service. Now, this is something I've heard over the years and internalized, but I never really realized how much we do until we started working on this presentation. But Pastor Tom, we only have a few minutes, so we're gonna to have to focus. Oh, I thought we had about a half an hour. <laughs> well, um, the, the church made a big change in the 60s. Uh, at the time when the city was going through civil unrest, it decided to stay, to stay in the neighborhood in which it was located rather than move to the suburbs. And at that, that time, it created two very important social ministries that are still viable today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about them, Lifeline Partnership and Community Family Life Services. Lifeline Partnership works with about 250 uh, teenage and adults who are developmentally disabled. And probably the, the best story I can tell you about that population is Pastor Suzanne Bloom, who's our director of that organization, uh, tells me this story that uh, a couple, about a year ago, the group came in the morning for a cooking class and then stayed in the afternoon for a, a movie afternoon. And she told the class to, to, to set up the chairs, five across and three deep. Well, the group never got that instruction. They kept, she kept having to repeat it again, five across, three deep. At the same time, she told them, we have two different kinds of chairs, one with arms and one with art arms. And the ones with arms, you can't stack, so you got to push them to the side. That they got right away. Why? Because they have always been treated that they are different than others. And so for that reason, we decided we needed to be in ministry with them. Then uh, Community Family Life Services was all crea also created in the 60s, of which I came in 82, 1982 to be the executive director. I no longer do that, but we work with the, the homeless, as, as, as Bishop Graham said, we're, we're a couple blocks away from the largest shelter, uh, I think, in the world. Uh, we have housing, we have uh, emergency services, food and clothing. We also provide a mentoring and, and jobs for those in need. But one story about Community Family Life Services that I can tell that happened to me is uh, about 1986, we decided to renovate this old house or an old townhouse, a row house next to the church. And we created 20 housing there. 
And I had to interview homeless families to decide who could come into the, to the units. And uh, a woman came to me and she says, uh, I'm thinking about having an abortion. And I said to her, well, if you have an abortion, you can't move into these units because that has to be families with children. Well, um, life went on and I went on and I got a call about eight, ten years ago and she said, hello, this is Michaela. I said, Michaela, Michaela, do I know you? And she said, I was one of the first families that moved into your housing units all those years ago. And I had my child. And I am now living in Milwaukee. I am the executive assistant of a CEO of a mid-sized company, and I own my own home. Then you know you did a good job. Or at least the Holy Spirit through me did a good job. And so that's what Community Family Life Services does. But then we decided we wanted to do a little bit more. You've heard that old adage, you can give a person a fish and he, eat, and he eats for the day. You teach a person to fish and he eats for a lifetime. So we created New Course Restaurant, of which you had lunch with today. And if you don't like your sandwiches, uh, let me give you the, address, the phone number of our chef. Don't complain to me. But we started that in 1992, and we've gotten jobs for over 600 people who are working in the food service industry all over Washington, D.C. It's not only that, but it's also partnerships with the community. Uh, in our neighborhood, we are uh, part of a large uh, neighborhood association called the Penn Quarter Neighborhood. This is kind of a cool neighborhood association because the shelter is part of it. And also most of the museums, all the Smithsonian's, are in this neighborhood association. So it's kind of cool to go to the meetings. But they came to us and they said, we have uh, 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 the police memorial here and we need a place to house the gift store during police week. So when that happens in May, over 10,000 people come to our church and we get a little money, a pretty good money from the rent we charge them and it's a great partnership. That's how we got solar on our flat roof who coexists with our bees, all through partnerships through our neighborhood. But our commitment to service doesn't stop at the borders of our city. Uh, we are currently worshiping with another congregation, St. Matthew's, while they redevelop their property in southwest D.C. Their pastor, Pastor Philip Huber, was a leader in the recovery after Hurricane Sandy in Maryland. He still has significant ties to the, community, or to the disaster response community, and so he was able to help our two congregations respond efficiently and effectively to natural disasters, particularly this year. As part of our God's Work, Our Hands Sunday this year, one of our projects was to assemble 10 disaster cleanup buckets. And then we also raised money for an additional 11. We've sent volunteers as far as the Gulf Coast to help in actually re physically cleaning up and rebuilding after disasters. I have led three teams to El Salvador and will be leading a fourth team this February to build houses with Habitat for Humanity and Thrivent. By working with Thrivent, we've been able to connect not only with the families we were helping to build houses for, but also the larger Lutheran church in El Salvador. And this is, don't, don't forget about our bees. You see, <laughs> every year we take the honey and we bottle it and we sell it. <clears throat> $10 a bottle. There's one of the jars. That's one of the jars. And then we, we use the money for ELCA disaster relief. This is in addition to what we did last Advent, where we raised over $4,000 for world hunger relief efforts. We had a tree that had ornaments with different farm animals that could we, we could sponsor for families who needed it around the world. Then the kids, at the end of the service every Sunday, would be able to come in, and using the money that had been donated and raised that Sunday, they got to go shopping. And that was a lot of fun. Through this all, however, there is a significant common thread. Someone, somewhere, came up with an idea, and it usually wasn't one of the pastors. Amen. You see, I grew up in the church. I grew up in a Lutheran church just south of Atlanta, Georgia. Both of my parents had also grown up in a church. My dad grew up Lutheran, and my mom grew up Southern Baptist. It was pretty much a given that no matter what congregation I was a part of, I was going to be an active member. It started out when I was little, being in Sunday school and in the Christmas pageants, and continued on as I was a youth and going to youth group and youth gatherings, and some of those youth gatherings coincided with the Senate Assembly, and 
I got in and I saw how church governance worked and I'm a nerd. I loved it. <laughs> so a lay member of my congregation suggested that I put my name in to be the youth representative or youth voting member from the Southeastern Synod to the upcoming churchwide assembly in Denver. So at the age of 16, I was elected to my first churchwide because she went around to all of her friends in the Senate Assembly, vouched for me, and got me elected. It's the first of four I've been to. I'm a nerd. I'm proud of it. <laughs> I'm okay with it. My trajectory at First Trinity continued much along the same way. You see, there's a joke that if you're there for a few weeks, the pastoral team makes you a leader in the congregation. There's more than a little truth to that. You see, I started small, joining the choir. Then they said, well, why don't you, since you've been here like two weeks, join the worship planning committee? Okay, well, you're doing good. Now we need a, a lay minister of worship on our church council. Could you do that? Yeah, okay, sure. All right, well, that's going well. How about you join the synod council? Thanks. You're welcome. Sure. It seemed I had temporarily forgotten how to say no. But that's okay, because along the way, everything I was encouraged to do was in line with my own interests and ability. For example, when I suggested that I use my legal skills to help rewrite our church governing documents so that we could have a, a better reflection of the way our, our congregation currently worked and have more bottom-up instead of top-down leadership, I was told, sure, go for it. Now, Pastor Tom, I just want to remind you, that effort had absolutely nothing to do with wanting to stay lay minister of worship and not be on the church council. Okay. Not a thing. But I also want to remind you that the president of the congregation is coming up. Will you mind uh, serving <laughs> in that role? You see? It may take a push or a gentle shove to uh, encourage our people, even though they may not have experience, they certainly are full of abilities and full of enthusiasm to, to do something. Uh, minus our bees, as you can see, we are not a large church, but we are called by God and led by the Spirit, and it's the pastor's job to get out of the way. Thank you for hearing our story.